Man, this introduction stinks. Actually, everything on this channel stinks. Literally. One of the things about wildlife that is not translated through video is smell. A great deal of things in nature smell awful. Even cute things, like penguins and seals. At least allegedly. I've never actually whiffed either of those animals. Of course, when you realize a lot of things in nature smell awful, the most sane thing to start to wonder is what smells the worst. I mean, there has to be a winner, right? From what I've read into, there's no undisputed soat among the living things on Earth. Smell appears to be a sensation science has not found a great way to measure. Going into this, I was fully expecting some kind of Scoville test like they have for spiciness, but for awful stenches. I have looked far and wide, and no such thing exists. Instead, what smells the worst seems to be a relatively subjective idea, with several candidates. So let's go over them. To give some perspective onto the smells we will deal with, let us start off with one stinker we are all familiar with, the skunk. Skunk smell comes from their anal glands, which are not exclusive to skunks. Many mammals have anal scent glands, mainly to communicate with each other. Even humans have these, but personally, I have not figured out how to use my anal glands. Yet. Anyways, the skunk has specially adapted these glands to smell as awful as possible. The spray is made of an organic compound called thiols, which contains sulfur. Rotten eggs also contain sulfur, just for a comparison. Adding on to that, skunk spray is volatile enough to temporarily blind at close range, can scare off a bear, and can be detected by a human nose more than 5 kilometers downrange. So yes, skunks are pretty stinky. The tamandua is a whole nother animal. I mean, obviously, in like a literal sense, but <laughs> forget it. The tamandua is also known as the lesser anteater, being a relative to the much more well-known giant anteater. The tamandua must have taken spite in being labeled the lesser of the two, because it set out to be one of the most hostile offenders to the nose. According to some, it smells five to seven times worse than the infamous skunk. This most awful smell is once more a self-defense odor from those anal glands that purportedly sticks to anything in a dozen meter radius. As well, they seem to be constantly in poor hygiene. I don't know what's in those ants that I presume they're eating, but basically everything that is noted coming out of their body is especially foul, even by animal standards. The tamandua also has a constant cloud of flies around it in the wild, just to hammer the point home in cartoonish fashion. This, ladies and gentlemen, is our starting point. The smells don't get much better from here. Sometimes, animals don't have the courtesy of merely spraying you with a chemical concoction. The hoopo is a widespread bird across the old world, and is in fact a symbol of significance to several cultures throughout. In some cases, they were looked at as symbols of royalty. In other cases, not so much. And after researching their behavior, I understand a negative connotation. Hoopo adults are actually rather elegant and relatively unsmelly, but all you have to do is get near a hoopo nest to understand their reputation. As chicks, hoopos are as physically imposing as damp cotton balls. There's absolutely no reason for a snooping predator to not eat them. But the species do have a trick up their wing to discourage attackers. From glands at the base of their tail, they release a liquid that smells of rotting meat. Brooding females release this same fluid and assist in rubbing it all over their offspring. It keeps the feathers flexible and watertight, acts as a mild antibacterial agent, and hey, now your kids smell like that animal. What's not to like? Up their other wing, the babies in particular have an even more vile trick. If met with the face of a predator, the whole nest will turn away, power up, and proceed to sh all over them. The blast reaches a range of half a meter, and that collaborative concoction combined with the rotting meat smell of the young means the unmitigated horror that a hoopo brood can commit has to be up in contention for worst smells produced by life. After learning this, you might find yourself asking, why God, why? Maybe specifically, why is the smell of these two things, decaying matter and feces, so spectacularly bad? What you should really ask is why we react so poorly to smelling them. Smells are just chemicals in the air. It's how our olfactory system interprets these chemicals that designate them as smelly to us. 
And for many animals, it's only a positive to hate the smells of certain substances. Take for instance, we humans. Feces and the decayed are chock full with harmful pathogens that our immune system would rather not tussle with. Sometimes it's easier just to evade than to battle disease. So our ancestors who avoided these things altogether because their noses told them to survived over the ones who didn't. This isn't exclusive to humans, by the way. All animals have to fear pathogens, and tests on animals as distant to us as fish have shown an olfactory aversion to stinky things. <coughs> Rats and mice are not affected by the stench as they make their living scrummaging in gross things. What they think smells truly terrible is cat pee. Probably because mice who thought cat pee reeks the most avoided cats the most. So really, sensing those stinky chemicals is very important to us. It's just that these animals have found a way to exploit that gross-out mechanism for their own protection. Stink is not always to keep everything away. A pungent odor gets you noticed, and for some creatures, it's positive attention. Behold the muskox. As a purely scientific fact, muskox have very little to look forward to. There just isn't much to do on a bleak tundra. I guess except spread false rumors. For instance, they're not oxen, they're most closely related to sheep and goats. As well, they don't produce any true musk, whatever that means. The reason they are called musk ox is due to the one thrilling time of the year for these herbivores. In the late summer mating season begins, and male musk ox start wetting their shaggy fur with incredibly pungent urine, which is meant to attract females. Mammals are able to determine a lot of information based on the scent of excretions like urine, as any asparagus eater will tell you. So, in the case of muskox, a male with funk is probably interpreted by females as one in good health and ready to mate. I can't critique. Game is game. Absurd levels of smell have even more uses. Take a look at yet another cold weather animal, the wolverine. Yes, the wolverine is in fact real, and just as cool as the X-Men character. Oh, so does it also have retractable metal claws, regeneration, and the immaculately sculpted face of Hugh Jackman? No. Its powers stem from the fact that it is completely psychotic. Wolverines don't exceed 30 kilos in weight, but will pick fights with wolves and have been known to hunt down deer and even adult moose, which is just ridiculous. Their scientific name translates in Latin to glutton, twice, and they will go to extreme lengths to feed themselves. This includes how they use their odor. A relative of the skunk, wolverines omit a terribly rancid smell, an odd combination of smelly cheese and honey. Like plenty of animals, the wolverine will rub this scent on their surroundings to mark their territory. As well, they will also douse food in their scent, both as a good reminder to any opportunists that they're messing with a wolverine's leftovers, and to make the meat too repugnant for any self-respecting animal to eat. Although wolverine smell is not just confined to their belongings, the beasts are known to invade winter cabins, devouring food stores, and only leaving their signature awful stench. Using stink in a useful manner is not constrictive to animals. Flowers are known for their smells, and the largest individual flower in the world, of the genus Rafflesia, is no different. But being a flower and having a smell is just about the only thing the genus has in common with a garden rose. The meter-wide Rafflesia don't grow in sublime little bushels, but instead suck the nutrients out of plants with their parasitic vines. To spread their sinister ways, the Rafflesia requires pollinators, and since this flower is just trying to be evil, its pollinators of choice are carrion flies, who normally feed on rotting carcasses. Suddenly, the spotty red color, grotesque appearance, and aroma of, you guessed it, rotting flesh make a lot of sense for attracting insects whose favorite thing is death. A plant maybe even more striking and foul than the Rafflesia is the three meter tall Titan Arum, better known as the corpse flower. It too must be pollinated by meat-loving carrion flies, and emits a fragrance not dissimilar to a Thanksgiving banquet, with a hint of grandma's cooking and a dash of, uh, who am I getting, it smells like rotting flesh. It even puts in the effort to warm up to a temperature similar to a recently expired animal to attract insects. The Titan Arum has to make certain those grubby bugs pollinate it when the time comes. The giant plants only blossom very rarely, 
It can go years, even decades, without opening its huge leaves and exposing its many flowers. Expanding the energy necessary to bloom for such a massive plant means it can only do it sparsely throughout its lifetime, making the arum an incredible event when it does blossom for a day and a half. And fortunately, that means most of the time our noses are saved. But for my money, if I were to give the title of smelliest life form to any one thing, it's not some giant flower or musky beast, but the durian fruit. Durians native to Southeast Asia are purportedly pretty tasty on the inside, but the malodor of their spiky outside layers is enough to get them banned from public spaces in Singapore, and to have caused a scare over a gas leak in Australia after one was left out in the open at a college library. The specific smell is the complete package, supposedly combining the odors of pig feces, turpentine, onions, and gym sock. The best part of it is that the durians smell this way not to avoid predation or attract some flesh-eating insect, but for us. Yes, the durian is trying to entice us humans and our primate relatives with its out-of-the-world smell in order to disperse the plant's seeds. It might seem odd a smell so foul is meant to attract us, but some humans, and probably many monkeys, do appreciate the potent smell. And even if you hate it, you have to admit the scent of a durian definitely grabs your attention. Suffice it to say, the durian really, really tries to be the smelliest thing to us humans. And I think intent matters the most in this debate. Smell is subjective, so what you and I think actually smells the worst will be different. Instead, be captivated by the fact everything here is not just an ordinary stinker. They went out of their way to smell as powerfully as possible, each for their own reasons. And for the durian, if their purpose for reeking is just to get us to notice it, then it feels right if we humans acknowledge it as the smelliest organism. So congrats, durian. You stink. Hello and thanks for watching. I was being completely honest when I said I thought there was going to be like an objective smell scale, so writing this video was definitely different than what I expected. Still, I think I ended up with something I really enjoyed writing, and I hope such a goofy idea was entertaining for you all. As always, thanks to Dara Hughes for the wonderful music, thanks to the wonderful images and videos I used to make this, thank you for watching, see ya!